Welcome to this month's edition of the Exadicta Ask Tom Office Hours. This month, we answer your questions about Exadicta X8M, which incorporates persistent memory, or PMEM, and RDMA over converged Ethernet, Rocky, to the Exadicta architecture. The idea for these office hours is to make these experts available to the community so that you can ask the questions that you might have about the latest version of Exadata, Exadata X8M, and of course things in that neighborhood, directly from the people who define and build the product. My colleague Gavin Perish and I are honored to have as our guest Jashi. Ja is responsible for a large team in Exadata development and is one of the foremost technical experts on these new technologies. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. So, Gavin Parrish, uh, Product Manager for Exadata. And, yeah, with me is Ja. Um, ja, you're probably one of my favorite engineers here. Uh, <laughs> the, Thank the, you, the Gavin. Level, <laughs> the level of really engagement that. and, and the, the knowledge that you have. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to to be talking with you about um, X8M. There's kind of two big areas of Exadata X8M, and I'm just going to quickly run through them. Um, X8M is, is different. It's, we've changed something that looks fundamental. You know, the, the network piece of Exadata was InfiniBand, has been InfiniBand from the beginning. And all of a sudden now we've come out with a generation that no longer uses it. Changing something like the network is is kind of scary. Um, but you know, I've I've been in PM for a year now, and I've worked with people like Jar for a year. And the more I got into it, and the more I read into the move from InfiniBand to Rocky, the more I became comfortable with the fact that Rocky is actually just an extension to InfiniBand. Um, you know, we've got this slide up at the moment around that talks about, you know, InfiniBand and basically RDMA is, is the, um, is what we're really chasing here. Um, having the optimizations of remote direct memory access. And we had that with InfiniBand for 10 years or for 15 years, really in engineering speak. Um, and now we have that with Rocky. So Ja, do you want to, do you want to give us a, a bit of a background on um, why we chose Rocky and, and why now, I suppose, is, is the bigger question for me. Sure. Um, that's a really good question. So kind of to put things back into perspective, um, we're talking about 100 gigabits um, uh, rate right now, the 100 gigabits links right now. So when Exadata was first started, that was in 2008. Um, we were on, <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers what speed we were on, but we're on a much slower network. Um, that was 20 gigabits per second, but that was like by far the state of the art um, circa 2008. And then to be able to do RDMA is incredibly important for Exadata because RDMA, as that, um, Gavin has mentioned, give us several real benefits for our customer workloads. You know, it gives us a low latency transport, it uses very little CPU, it's all offloaded to the card, and it gives us really high throughput. So back in the days when Exadata was first started, um, it wasn't really an option for us to choose anything other than InfiniBand because RDMA was only available on IB. So that was a really obvious choice uh, with a lead in the, in the link rate of 20 gigabits back in 2008. But now, fast forward to now, what happens now is that Ethernet has, uh, for the most part, caught up with InfiniBand in terms of feeds and speeds. So Ethernet has 100 gigabits similar to IB, and we also have this um, amazing new technology called Rocky RDMA over Converge Ethernet. So that really allows our software staff to be able to continue to harness the power of RDMA to ensure the best performance while being able to have a choice of either continuing on with our InfiniBand infrastructure or switching over to Ethernet. And then um, the choice is actually not too hard to, to make because 
um, if you look at um, nowadays, like um, as we are, um, Exadata is already in the cloud, both in the form of cloud at customer as well as cloud uh, in the public cloud. Using Ethernet is by far the most um, palatable choice for you know integrating Exadata into a cloud data center, right? Because that's where um, the Ethernet uh, networking fabric is prevalent, and uh, we don't necessarily want to restrict our Exadata to its own private island of InfiniBand um, network um, partitions. So that's why um, we have made the choice of switching over to uh, Rocky switching over to Ethernet because it allows us to have the best performance, which is 100 gigabits per second, it allows us to continue to use RDMA the same way as we do before, um, and in more and creative ways that we do with PMEM that I think Gavin's going to talk about a little bit later. And thirdly, um, really gives us, you know, a very nice uh, platform to kind of integrate into the cloud data center, where it's, you know, mostly IP and Ethernet based. So, Gavin, I hope that kind of puts some perspective into, yeah. you know, the switch of the network that we uh, did for X Data M, and uh, hopefully answer the questions on why we're making this decision now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, you're welcome. Can you explain? as if you are talking to someone who doesn't know, understand the why, what part of the, of the, the what part Rocky plays in Exadata? Why is it important to a customer? Um, I kind of I have sort of touched on the, the, the key parts here, but from a customer's point of view, um, there are many benefits of running on the Exadata platform, right? Um, we have the best, you know, state-of-the-art hardware, and we built very smart system softwares to kind of go along with the hardware to really allow us to extract out the, hard, the, the power of the hardware and present them as really amazing performance and database performance for our customers. And we have an automated management stack that really tries to make sure that the whole experience of using Exadata and uh, um, on-prem and on, in the cloud are extremely smooth. So kind of coming back to why Rocky is important is that, um, Fundamentally, Exadata is a shared storage architecture. And this shared storage architecture really is extremely powerful because it allows us to have this boundless linear scale on the storage side. So if you are running out of storage or need it to have more space or more performance, what you can do is simply by you know, adding more storage servers to existing Exadata systems. And that just kind of linearly scales out the performance and gives you this um, really nice uh, ability. And then for any database nodes running on that uh, system, you're able to basically uh, draw the power of all the, the aggregate of all the storage system in your um, rack. And that's why this is a very compelling architecture for all of our customers. And to be able to support this uh, shared uh, storage architecture, uh, we have to communicate via some um, network links, right? So that's why networking between the database nodes and the storage servers are extremely important. And uh, for a net, like if you ask anybody, what is a good network? I think there will be three things that come to mind. The first, I think the, um, um, the, 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 the Joe has already touched on is like low latency. We really want like our small messages, you know, for OLTP, for example, random reads or log writes to go super fast with really low latency because that really helps with application performance. So that uh, Rocky RDMA over Converge Ethernet is able to deliver that to us because we're able to use RDMA to have this, um, you know, 19 microsecond uh, read latency for random IOs that I think Gavin's gonna talk about when it goes to PMEM. And then the second part of a good network is that we want the, good net the network to give us really high um, network bandwidth. And this is perhaps not as relevant in the OLTP cases, but it's extremely helpful in many other use cases of database workloads. For example, if you have um, um, an RMAN, like a backup or restore type of workloads, or you have scan workloads that require spill, like a lot of temp reads and writes to the storage, or even you know just a regular like a scan and time a smart scan that need to return a lot of data back to the database. For all those cases, a high throughput network between the compute and then the shared uh, storage is extremely important. 
So the third part of a good network is that we really want to be able to enjoy low latency, high throughput, and not having to pay any cost, right? So we like I remember in the in the day in the earlier days, you know, like the 2008 when we were just working on Exadata and getting V1 ready, we did look at Ethernet uh, and compared with InfiniBand. And then that comparison was like a no-brainer because what happens is there was no RDMA um, on Ethernet. So when we started transferring large packets, instead of using RDMA, you just have to sort of do the B copy send uh, using Ethernet. And that requires so many levels of mem copies, you know, from the application to the kernel, from the kernel to the network. On the sender side, the packets uh, arrives on the other hand and gets copied out all the way up. And then we just see that, you know, like it's very easy to busy up all the CPUs when you crank up the load on Ethernet. But for InfiniBand, because of RDMA, we're able to actually have a cake and eat it too, meaning have very high throughput and use very little CPU. So that choice was very um, uh, was very easy in the earlier days because InfiniBand was just far, far exceeded uh, Ethernet in terms of the uh, feeds and speed uh, um, on all those three attributes of the network, a good network. But so nowadays, you, they're essentially the same. We don't see any you know, difference between the two technologies. So it made the choice much easier to say, look, Ethernet is just the more, you know, more prevalent technology, the, the common, you know, thread in all of our data centers and the cloud data centers. So that's why it's, it's, it's kind of a good decision for us to switch over to Ethernet. So Gavin, I heard you were going to say something. So please, please chime in. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, to um, jump on one of those things. You mentioned, you know, InfiniBand was a no-brainer over Ethernet, but the alternatives to doing what we've done with Exadata, so the whole storage network and actually using a network to access storage is pretty unique. Um, you know, most vendors and, you know, some of the very big storage companies continue pushing um, big, dumb storage. Do you want to just explain why we went that networking route versus um, storage, you know, uh, SAN kind of topology? Yeah. Okay. That's a really good question, <laughs> Gavin. So um, they're like a really, like, I believe that's like a twofold decision. The first one is that I guess the most important one really, when you look at this is that um, Exadata, when we first released um, the secret sauce, I think right now everybody probably knows it really well is um, the secret sauce was the smart scan and it continues to be a very important uh, uh, like a marquee feature on the Exadata platform. Um, so when you run a smart scan, what it requires is that we have this fully integrated stack between the database and the server. And then we run this called IDB um, protocol between the database and the storage server to um, allow the database to pass down the metadata for every query so that we are able to offload the predicate processing and column projection, all that heavy lifting filtering, we call it, um, during query processing um, to the storage so that we don't have to ship tons of terabytes and terabytes of data back to the compute while clogging the internet and interconnect. So that was the original design of Exadata. And that really sort of eliminated the whole like fiber channel of SAM because we really want to be able to communicate on a non, like, you know, on, 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 on a network that's really high speed and, uh, and gives us um, and the ability to, you know, have a custom um, protocol as well as being able to give us this low latency, low latency and high throughput. So um, RDMA was a big, big deal even back then as well, because that really is, like I said earlier, let us have high throughput, low, la low latency, and fair with very li little CP whole CPU consumption. And that was the only option, you know, back in the days where, you know, nobody can deliver that, not Ethernet, not SAN, not the fiber channel. They're far, they were far, far, far behind in terms of technology. But today, you know, Ethernet has definitely caught up. And that's why we're, you know, really happy with Rocky, you know, the converged RDMA over, uh, sorry, RDMA over converged Ethernet, because it really gives us all that IB has to offer and allow us to really, you know, be able to integrate Exadata much better into like the larger scale of the data center network. Cool. Yeah. And just, 
just on top of that, I mean, I, I'm, we're showing the OSI, well, a very simple, we're just showing on the right-hand side a very simple OSI stack um, from hardware at the bottom up to the application at the top. So the, the application level, so really the, the database and grid infrastructure sitting in the application tier, the user space, um, is still using InfiniBand. So it's still using the same verbs, yeah? So it's all of the benefits that you've been working on for the last 15 years, Jar, is still there. So you haven't had to rewrite all of that code. Yeah, that's exactly right. Because it would have been, you know, um, probably not. <laughs> it would be a significant undertaking <laughs> if we had to change our application code. But the good thing about, you know, converting from InfiniBand to Rocky is that, like, the um, the the verb player or, you know, the RDMA stack all remain the same. So we had to, you know, make very small adjustment to our RDMA stack to be able to uh, work with uh, Rocky from, from InfiniBand. So. And just just the fact that you know you've done that, moving from InfiniBand to Rocky for me anyway. Um, I'd like to hear from customers more on this, but um, the move from InfiniBand to Rocky isn't that big a deal. It's yes, it's a what can be seen as a brand new network. But if you've got what well, what would it be like ninety nine percent identical code code that you've written and worked on for the last 15 years that's bulletproof, moving that across is, is actually quite easy. And you don't have to worry about, you know, bugs creeping in or, or new code paths being, being worked on. So, yeah. Yeah, that's very, very true, you know, because I personally, <laughs> um, as Gavin has mentioned, lead the um, development team. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's I personally really appreciate the fact that we actually have a stable uh, mm -hmm. interface like APIs that we code to. And even though we switch from uh, InfiniBand to Rocky, um, there is very little like touch points we actually had to adjust to make it work on both IB and then Rocky, the, like Gavin said, 99 or even higher, 99.9 .9 or even higher ratio of code or basically all that hardened code continue to work well. And uh, that's definitely a huge plus for, um, for you know, helping to make this decision, the transition easier and, uh, and uh, much more reliable and with high quality for our customers as well. I think this, this, this whole uh, innovation shows two important things that are a theme in how we think about Exadata. One is that we want to bring the best innovations, but we are, have to do that in the least disruptive way to the end users. And so it's not just it, that it makes just life uh, uh, less difficult, I'm not gonna say easier, because she has to do a lot of very hard stuff, to have this, uh, to, to have this uh, interoperability when we switch uh, the transport, uh, the, the, the network from, from uh, InfiniBand to Rocky, while keeping the, 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 the verse of InfiniBand and therefore, uh, getting the risk mitigation that comes from not having to change everything. That is very, very, very central to how we look at the world, right? It's very important. We don't want anybody to be in the uh, bleeding edge. We want people to get the cutting edge of technology, but we package it and we deliver it in a safe way that is extremely stable and extremely reliable. That's, that's very important, right? It's, it's a central a philosophy that we have. The other thing that I would like to point out, all of this is basically a summary of what uh, John and Gavin have been saying, is that we are not religious about the technology that we use. We try to use the best technology that has the, uh, uh, the largest adoption. So for us, in a way, it's only natural that now that Ethernet can deliver the kind of performance and quality that we need, uh, uh, for for the requirements of the machine, we take it up. Mm. Um, when we couldn't get that from uh, uh, Ethernet, we used InfiniBand. But if you look at the components, you can see that there is a technology strategy of long-term stability and, and 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 sustainability by using the best technology, but from a, a large 
uh, as part of a large population of companies that consume that technology wherever possible, because that guarantees uh, availability, uh, guarantees getting the best innovation from the makers of those technology and getting, of course, uh, reasonable cost. Of course, this is still enterprise grade, high quality stuff, right? Yeah, well, I, I think that's, you've perfectly stated it there. It's, it's um, cutting edge, not bleeding edge. And, you know, working with the engineering team, Jar and, and the other senior engineers, um, I know these guys have been looking at, at the technologies and, you know, what we see you know, and what I get to speak about from a product management point of view is, is the end point. You know, the amount of hardware and, and technologies and, um, you know, new things happening in the industry that are looked at, that are, you know, we, they determine whether or not to, um, you know, take it further. And so Rocky has been something that I know has been in the pipe for many years. It's not just a, a let's, let's do it next week kind of thing. This has been in the, in the works for quite a while. And everything that we get to take advantage of from an exadata point of view has been thoroughly researched for, for many years beforehand. The, the research and development from Oracle in Exadata is, is immense. And any, any other comments, Shah? Um, otherwise, I might just flip across to the kind of the second piece of, of XADM um, to talk about. So persistent memory. Um, this is one of the, you know, it's, it's really amazing when you're around and you're actually involved in seeing a new, um, a new disruptive technology being added to the industry. And persistent memory is, is one of those things. Um, it's a, a new technology from, well, currently from Intel around, and it's exactly how it sounds. It's persistent and it's memory. It's, it's persistent, so if there's a power failure um, or you know, server reboot or whatever, the memory, uh, the data persists. Um, so therefore it's not like DRAM, which is ephemeral. However, it's, it's memory. So the persistent memory that we use is sitting on the memory bus. So if you think back to your, um, you know, your storage hierarchy, we have a, a new place between you know, from CPU at the top with the fastest access to, to data in the L2, you know, L1, L2, L3 cache. Then you've got DRAM, which is, um, you know, very fast. It's sitting on the memory bus directly next to the CPU. So it's super high speed, but pretty expensive in terms of gigabytes per, um, per dollar. And then you're all of a sudden back out at the PCIe bus and, and the um, storage controller level and while you get great um, amount of storage, it's not very fast. So persistent memory has come in and it sits between DRAM and PCIe. It's sitting on the memory bus and therefore gets all the benefits of, of being right next to the CPU. Um, but it's, it, it's got greater storage to it than what you would get from DRAM. So it's actually cheaper per gigabyte um, than DRAM. That is what, you know, that's how I see persistent memory. Um, it's brand new and it's a brand new tier within the storage hierarchy. And, um, you know, the engineering team again have been working with Intel and, and looking at this for years. So, Joe, how, how close am I in, in my description? <laughs> Very well said, Gavin. <laughs> um, so this has always been like, um, a, you know, a huge favorite um, topic of mine because um, honestly, for the last like um, four years, I've been telling people that um, that has been the focus and that, um, you know, what we have dedicated our efforts uh, focusing on is really building this amazing uh, solution. So as Gavin has mentioned, persistent memory is a brand new silicon. It's different from flash, different from um, DRAM. And as this little icon or graph showed on the upper uh, left corner of the slide shows, kind of sits in between DRAM and flash in terms of its um, performance characteristics. The reads are actually pretty close to DRAM speeds, but the, uh, um, but, um, the good thing about its writes is that it's persistent. So 
what we really wanted to be able to do with persistent memory is we feel like it is a golden opportunity for us to um, uh, accelerate the database workloads. And now one of the really um, attractive options for um, the database workloads acceleration for PMEM when it comes to persistent memory is really um, the OLTP applications. So when you think about an online transaction processing workloads, um, the I.O. patterns are actually drastically different from a data warehousing analytical workload. So from a, let's imagine that banking application actually, or the database actually runs on the Exadata. So what it really uh, shows up in terms of its I.O. pattern is a bunch of random reads, right? It's kind of walking down a B tree index uh, tree and be able to, you know, fetch a block. So OLTP application is very, very sensitive to random read latency. They really want like a really low latency random reads to make the application run super fast. So we kind of crossed that bridge once with Flash before because back in the days, you know, in V1 of Exadata, we actually didn't quite have a very compelling OLTP story because there was no Flash in there. And disks are extremely notorious for being uh, very uh, sluggish in terms of IOPS or latency because of the inherent uh, architecture limitation on disks. You know, they have this um, head. So anytime you do a random uh, read, they have to go position the head, have a seek latency, have a rotational latency, wait until the spinning media to like, you know, be on the right track. And then before this data can be transferred off the disk. And it's also kind of serial, right? There's a single queue in the disk. So it's like all the IOs are very, it's not parallel at all. And it doesn't work very well for a, a OLTP read. So Flash kind of helped us a lot, made bounds and leaps, you know, um, lots of improvement over that because it's inherently parallel and that it's able to give us hundreds of um, thousands of IOPS. And that's really amazing with like low latency, like below 100 microseconds. And that has worked out well for us with our client and server model, like I mentioned before. And Gavin has shown, you know, on this slide, you have a database sitting on the compute server and you have storage sitting on the, on the other end of the network. And then we would basically be able to just send a request over the network, wake up a storage server process. That um, process will go in ahead and issue a read from our local flash cache on the storage server, get the block back 100 microseconds later, and send it back to the compute server. So typically, we see a very low latency around 200 uh, microseconds for a single block read. So that was already deemed to be really good with um, OLTP applications and especially you know with MBME flash and all that the latency keeps going down and we're able to get to 200. But however in the face of um, you know persistent memory it takes less than one microsecond okay to read an 8k block from persistent memory. So if we continue to use this paradigm of you know sending a message across and you know having the storage server process um, go read that block from the persistent memory and, and then send it back you know, the whole context switches and the, I, and the software instruction cost on the whole I.O. stack is going to far, far overwhelm the actual cost of the reading from PMEM alone. So in our example, that whole overhead is going to cost you 100 microseconds, and then your total end-to-end -end database I.O. latency is going to be 100 microseconds, not one microsecond if you were to read from a local PMEM. So that has been the biggest challenge that was, you know, set out for us. And then we really wanted to make sure that we don't have any, um, um, like we don't end up paying this whole 100 microsecond tax for um, this type of, uh, you know, when we have put persistent memory into our storage server. So the secret sauce that we are able to use to kind of resolve that issue is to by introducing this amazing technology or reintroducing, because we've always been using RDMA, but now we're using it in the most, um, I would say like flashy way, because we pair that up with um, PMEM. So from a database node, when you need to read a block, um, we put persistent memory in the storage server as another tier of caching on top of flash, because it's actually more limited in space. We only have about 1.5 terabytes of PMEM in every storage server, while we have like 25 terabytes of flash. So we put the hottest, you can imagine that out of that 25 terabyte of cache data, we pick the hottest 1.5 terabyte and stick them into the PMEM cache. 
So then we use RDMA to enable a database to directly access that, that, that PMEM uh, data directly without having to send a message over, wake up a storage process. Like the RDMA technology enables us to be able to perform the read without involving the OS or the CPU of the storage server. It just goes straight to the networking card that's RDMA um, capable, and that allows us to be able to return the block back to the compute server. Like the compute server will directly fetch it without you know, engaging the other end. And that's how we get to this um, 10x factor latency of 19 microseconds. So that is a, like, you know, in a way you look at this, it's like, okay, if I were to get a buffer from my local buffer cache, it takes, you know, super fast, nanoseconds, right? So, you know, cache workloads that runs really fast. But if you were to go to storage previously for every fetch read, I take, you know, 200 microseconds or longer. Now it's 19 microseconds, 10x faster. So that really translates directly into application performance improvement because all, all the foregrounds were previously, you know, waiting for those read IOs to complete can, you know, finish their work 10 times more efficiently. So that's why we think this is going to really boost the OLTP performance. So that's number one. Number two, the part two of the OLTP story is that other than reads, there's another very important player for OLTP performance, and that is log writes. So for redo log writes, that's a familiar topic, right? Like we know that, hey, redo log writes has to be super fast, and then there's a lot of optimization that we have done for that, for example, flash log um, on Exadata. So what we did in X8M is take it to the next level. So we look at persistent memory and we say, look, it has persistent in its name. So it is actually persistent. And that makes it a perfect candidate to host the redo log writes. Because as long as we are able to land the redo in the PMEM, we are guaranteed that the redo is going to be persistent even across any sort of planned or unplanned outages, where like cell server may crash, the storage server may reboot, but it's okay. The data is persistent. It's not volatile memory, it's persistent memory. And then the other um, theme we're trying to follow is very similar to what we have, what I have just talked about for the OLTP reads is that, look, we can't afford to send a message to the storage server or have the storage server then write to the PMEM because we're gonna incur that huge 100 microsecond tax that we have to pay, which really, you know, just erased all the gains we would otherwise get from the PMEM acceleration. So what we do again here is we go back to our good friend of RDMA and say, look, what we're going to do is we're actually going to use the RDMA write to send the redo log direct into the PMEM of the storage server. And as soon as that's done, then we say, hey, look, the redo, we know it's persistent, and then we're good to go. So the thing to note here is that when we write to the persistent memory buffer, it's not that you know the job is done. Like from a full ground, from a log writer point of view, yes, the reader is persistent and I'm good to go, but the storage server would actually get a completion uh, notification when such writes occur, and they'll actually wake up in the background and go ahead and actively move the redo from PMEM log buffer into the persistent backing store, you know, into the hard disk grid disk. So what ends up happening is we're only using PMEM for redo log as a temporary staging area to uh, stage the redo persistently. So that gives us the ability to have ultra low latency uh, log writes, but at the same time, we use very little space on the persistent memory to uh, make that work. So we actually use less than 0.1% of the persistent memory. So less than one gig of the PMEM is used for uh, redo log buffers. And all the rest, like 99.9% .9 of 1.5 terabytes, we set that aside to basically um, cache as many hot blocks in there as possible for PMEM cache use case I just talked about earlier. So this um, really allows us to be able to have the best of both worlds, right? Have as large of a PMAN cache as possible to accelerate like um, the OLTP random read workloads, and at the same time be able to also give this super super duper boost for redo log writes to persistent memory as well, while the cell serve actively, you know, uh, moving the redo, copying it back to the backing store in the background, not in a critical path. So that's how we feel like with both 
you know, the accelerated uh, random read and the accelerated log writes, we're really able to kind of give a complete new makeover, you know, to the OLTP application because you're able to get unprecedented performance boost uh, with the help of persistent memory and the RDMA. We're putting persistent memory in a storage. Like um, the, the whole storage, shared storage um, topic of, of Exadata, you know, it, it lends itself to having this kind of technology inserted for maximum gain. And, you know, so the, the idea of, of getting persistent memory in, into storage is, is incredible. And it, you know, it's worked. It, it's been amazing seeing the performance coming out of this. Um, but with, and, you know, I don't like um, blowing my own horn kind of thing, but this is, Oracle is the only, only company that can really do this um, yeah because of because of the it's really the software that is enabling all of this yeah 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 that that's very very true so um, you know we're so far far ahead um, in this persistent memory game that you know our leadership is just you know it's it's like I don't know what to say it's like there's no like remote second even on the landscape in terms of what we can do with um, you know, the, our software being able to harness the power of this amazing new silicon technology. We should probably kind of explain the persistent memory a little bit um, with a little bit more detail now. So the persistent memory, as you can see on, uh, you know, Gavin's slide, on the upper right quarter, you see a little sort of a dim there, right? So that is actually what a persistent uh, memory dim looks like. So we use the Intel um, data center um, P -mem -p and persistent memory module. So that's a, actually a dim form factor. And what happens is that um, on the storage server, we have 12, we have two CPU sockets with 12 memory channels. So six channels on each socket. And inside every channel, um, there's space to populate two DIMMs. So the way that persistent memory is populated is that for every channel, you populate one regular DIM for your regular DRAM. So the DRAM doesn't go away. It's still necessary and needed, very helpful there. And for the other um, DIM slot in that channel, you populate a persistent memory DIM. So when you boot up the system, you'll be able to have you know, your DRAM as normal to run your regular workloads, and you'll have persistent memory as well, in addition to the DRAM, where we run the persistent memory in this mode called AppDirect. So the AppDirect mode is really like enable the persistent nature of the persistent memory and be able to, for us to use it for either PMEM cache and uh, um, as well as for PMEM log, uh, like I talked about earlier. And um, this is um, probably, you know, also interesting to a lot of our uh, audience here is that persistent memory can also be used in a non in a volatile fashion, we call it the memory mode, not app direct mode. And if you use it in that fashion, you're just basically using it for its size because it has a capacity advantage over DRAM. And uh, um, the, the one that we use is 128 gigabytes per DIM, and then we have 12 of them. So that adds up to 1.5 terabytes. So that's a, a lot of memory, but um, if, but if you run it in a volatile mode, in a non-persistent fashion, then just larger memory and then your DIM is actually subsumed. So it acts kind of like a caching tier in front of that DIM, in front of the persistent memory. So your OS memory is just going to be uh, whatever the size of the persistent memory is. But you don't get to leverage the persistent nature of that persistent memory. So we kind of feel like, look, our story is even stronger because not only do we use persistent memory, we don't lose the um, 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 the, the DRAM size, you know, we still use the DRAM as we do today. And on top of that, we really uh, harness the power of the persistent uh, nature of persistent memory. So to answer Joe's question, it's not just a RAM. It's like we still have the DRAM, but we have the PMEM, you know, alongside with the DRAM. Like if I was another vendor, and if I was a competitor of Oracle's working with or trying to enable persistent memory, um, I suppose the easiest route would be, like you just mentioned, the memory mode. That that doesn't need any any code enhancements, does it? 
<laughs> yeah, that's that's so interesting, Gamma. I'm, I'm so, it's like it's funny how you um, made um, ask that question because um, I would say yes, most people who have actually used PMEM um, are um, you know sort of using it in a very limited way, which is in the memory mode, and uh, you know they have run some you know application benchmarks and stuff and produces some numbers. But you know, to us, it's not really the most interesting part of PMEM, right? Because yeah. for the reasons that we just have explained, and uh, um, like I said, we're just really far, far ahead of like our leadership in the PMEM um, space is really just you know truly amazing. It seemed like we were really focused and dedicated on making this work, and we <clears throat> we wanted to make sure that persistent memory is made available to Exadata customers on our platform. You know, as soon as Intel. Um, you know, put that in production versus, you know, a lot of, I mean, we're just really surprised a lot of companies like our competitors are sort of not really, you know, tuned in in there. And then they're like, just, you know, just they have very limited, if anything at all, offering in the persistent memory space. So, yeah, yeah well, we definitely then, feel like we're way ahead of the pack. And the the focus of of the engineering team and the the amount of hardware that gets vetted really um, and, you know, only things that are chosen to really increase the performance of the database and focusing on the database as the central figure in this whole, um, whole thing. This is a very good example, again, of what we are uniquely doing, which is if you really look at the architecture of Exadata, we basically redo the architecture. This is a more radical example but that's what we've been doing for many years from the beginning every new version reassembles the architecture to maintain the best trade-offs and in this case we have made a significant change in architecture because we have incorporated PMEM as a layer as opposed to just being fitting it into the existing architecture which is what everybody else is sort of forced to do the reason we can do it as a layer is because and it's because we understand the semantics of the, of the uh, 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 writes and the reads all the way down to storage as they in incorporate into the execution of a database workload and the database code. So you, you, it's not just that you can buy PMEM and you can put it in, in your, in your uh, systems you have to be able to, to, to get the most value and that the example of not taking it in the disk uh, format is exactly right. You have to, you have to be able to uh, disaggregate the software all the way down and convey the semantics of what every message and every read and every write means in the sense of what the database workload is. So using part of PMEM for part of the database log is only possible if you are pushing the semantics of this is a database log write down to the storage. And only we can do that because we have taken the approach of rethinking the architecture of this uh, uh, combined system and developing, of course, the software and the hardware, uh, engineering them together. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Okay, so the, the question, just to read it out, is I would like to know why X8M and not why X9? whether Oracle have planned to have two version in future releases with InfiniBand and another with Rocky. Okay, so first the naming, as, as Chris mentioned, the X8M. So we step our, our naming, um, we have it in step with the release of the CPU. So the Intel CPU that we use, um, whenever there is a generation change there, we upscale or up-level our generation. So the fact that we released the X8, the InfiniBand version, the X8, um, last April on the Cascade Lake. The X8M was also on the Cascade Lake CPU. So we actually made no changes in terms of um, the CPU or um, you know, the bulk of, of what the X8M was from the X8. So the only major change that we made, obviously, is the Rocky and the persistent memory. Um, everything else stayed stayed the same. So that that's why we didn't call it the X9, because the X9, we would have a CPU step happening there. So you can take from that, and if you have a look at the the history of, of Exadata, 
um, you'll see that you know when there's a new CPU, we have the new step. So you can assume from that that X9 um, will be coming out in future. So the question around two versions in future releases with InfiniBand and another with Rocky. So that's that's a more difficult um, question to answer. But I want to first state that we have thousands of racks, probably tens of thousands of racks out there at the moment. We have thousands of customers that we have been working with and helping over the, the 10, well, 11 years, I think, um, we're in our 11th year of, of selling. So we started in 2008. Um, so we're not going anywhere. You know, we're a, a very big company that, that has the backing and the R&D and the ability to maintain and monitor and, and ensure that our customers have success at every level. Um, and Exadata is no different to that. So we will continue to provide support and um, you know, the future for all of our customers, existing and new. The, whether or not there's a future release of InfiniBand and another of Rocky is not something that I can talk to. Um, it's still with the upper management. Um, we'll continue allowing and, and, you know, having expansion for our existing customers. The, the piece that I would probably say is why, why wouldn't you um, look at new technology? You know, we've, we've spent um, the research and development time and the effort to find the next best thing, or the next big thing, the next um, platform for the Oracle database, and that's the X8M. If you're if you have an existing footprint of Exadata, that is InfiniBand, we will continue supporting. There's no doubt there, We've, I've mentioned that. But unless you're actually scaling your existing physical footprint with adding new storage or compute, um, it's the same database. It's the same software. So we need to, to have the exact same lifecycle management and monitoring and everything between the two. So if you've got an existing footprint of Exadata, then the X8M is a, is a natural progression and that Rocky network is a natural progression to that um, unless you're physically expanding your, your, single, um, your single rack instances. If you have uh, the idea of production and disaster recovery, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of customers, they bring in the, the latest into um, into development first, but then move to production and then filter the older generations down into dev and test. So um, I would expect the exact same thing to happen with the X8M and, and future generations where you would bring in the, the next generation and filter the older generations down the line. Um, and because, you know, at the, at the heart of this is the Oracle database and um, the support that we have for the Oracle database is unwavering and, you know, constant between whatever generation it is. Um, that OSI stack that I showed earlier of the, the network, it's just the bottom two layers, the actual physical hardware that we've changed, but the upper stack, the application, the user level is identical. Um, it's, it's using the same thing. So whether or not it's, it's InfiniBand or Rocky actually doesn't, doesn't make as much difference. That we basically run our own cloud on the generations of Exadata as they come. So we ourselves have a, a continuity requirement. And remember what Gavin says, which is that unless you need to expand or horizontally an existing uh, InfiniBand Exadata, um, everything else should be transparent to you. And uh, the, the M version, well, I mean, it blows the, the, the non-M version out of the water, which is kind of amazing because it's, it's within the same calendar year, right? 
So we should probably let everybody go. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for, for attending. Uh, thank you so much for uh, asking our questions. Remember, you can continue to ask questions against this session and they will percolate to us and we'll do our best to answer them as, as, as quickly and as completely as possible. We'll have other development, uh, senior development people here uh, every month. And uh, we really want this to be a place where you can really get the closest to uh, walking down the corridors of our building and asking people questions, right? So a complement uh, 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 to all the other material that is out there. So I want to thank Ja especially, uh, whose time, as you might imagine, is extremely scarce. Uh, <laughs> and of course, Gavin, for driving this and for being our guests today. Uh, and I, of course, thank all of you in the audience for making time and for staying uh, late. Thank you, uh, Gavin. Thank you, Ja. Say thank goodbye you, Chris. for so long. <laughs> and uh, see you all in about a month. Yep, thank you. Bye.